I guess I'm going to talk about remote machines and like a lot of things that you know about them. Uh, first thing, just to like visualize, which this is from before, like a tiny VM. You cannot really get one in like Mac OS, but they're like some approximation, which is called some VM. But like you can say, like I'm creating new windows, and like it's rearranging everything, so I can see like 100% of, of my stuff. Like you can like make stuff, like make stuff like move around, and, like automatically. I mean, it's really convenient sometimes. But the thing I'm gonna focus right now is gonna be um, talking about remote machines. So if you have ever like developed software, like this is like a high chance, like at some point either for your homework or because you were like working in a company, you end up not using really your computer because your computer is really great like writing code, but it's not probably the best thing if you want to have like a web server where like it needs to run like 24-7 and it's not cool if it's closed because you're sleeping. Or if you need a computer that has like a hundred CPUs so you can run like your simulation of fluid dynamics. So uh, a lot of the time you can like customize a lot of work you are doing with your machine, but then you have to SSH into this machine and it's like not configured at all and you don't know how to kind of set up stuff so it works. So I'm just gonna go with like what were, were like some really common things but really can can pay off no matter. So the first thing you need to know is that the thing you really need to be using is SSH. Uh, what I'm gonna be using for the for the class is not the is not a, like a remote web server. Um, and so it's like one thing is like, if you don't have access to a web server, it can be like harder to kind of debug all the stuff. A really cool thing is you can create a computer within your computer. We covered this in the very first class. You can have like a VM and the VM will have like its own like IP address. You can SSH into that. The only thing you need to do is you need to as and you need to have like some daemon, some like SSH server that will be listening for like the clients that want to SSH in by default. Like Linux doesn't come with this, but you just install it. That's one of the exercises. But there's like this process here of SSHD that is running and is listening by default on the port 22. So now when we have that, we can just figure out what is the IP address of this machine. This is the this is the look back to that like John talked in another lecture and what we have here is the kind of the, the interface to my machine. So I can just go ahead and say oh, let me SSH into the machine, ask me for my password so I can authenticate. And I'm in. And I have like this completely different and I'm like within the machine. And here we are in a cell and we can just type commands and go right away. However, SSH is significantly more powerful than that. You don't really need a lot of time to just like SSH type a command. You won't maybe only care about the output of that command. So one thing that you can do is you can specify what you want to run when, when, when you do that. So here we type your password. And what this is doing is like this SSH is executing the command, is getting the output of that command, and is getting it back to the standard output. It means that SSH is not this kind of like really interactive tool. It, like you can place like SSH within like files. Like for example, let's say we're here and we can that we want to grab the output, so we get like those things that start with um, have like those something, and it, it will go through and like this is like lo like it's listing this remote folder and then it's grabbing locally. You can also do the the inverse, like we can like list the contents that are like in my home folder, and then pipe that into SSH and grab kind of the same thing. Like we can grab for all the files that start with yo. So what this is doing is listing the my, my local folders. I don't know how because I that's the wrong address. You could say use history. If I do that, I can throw my phone here. So what this is doing is, the output is the same, but it's happening a completely different thing. What this is doing is listing the home folders in my computer, then getting all that output, zipping it through SSH, and then running red on the, on the SSH on the, on the machine. So you, this can, so you can pipe things in and out of SSH. As you have already seen, it's asking me for my password every single time. And that gets like really, really awful, like really fast. Uh, 
of the, the kind of the way programmers have solved this issue is using SSH keys, which if you have already kind of set up some into a GitHub account, so you don't have to uh, enter your username and password every time you like, put some code, you probably have already some. The way these are played, they are like within this hidden folder called .ssh, and for demonstration purposes, I have remove mine, like probably you maybe only have like non-cost, if you have SSH into your machine, into any machine, just using your password, like non-cost, just for example, right now, what that file contains is that we just SSH into the VM, and it has like all these things that specify that we have already SSH there and we have authenticated, and we know that. So even if someone tries to fake being this person, like SSH will tell you. Like sometimes if you have reinstalled a new server and the cryptographic has like cryptographic key has, has changed, SSH will tell you like something has changed. Be aware of that. So you may see that if, for example, reinstall like a server and you see it. Uh, and the other thing is the SSH config that we will get at the end of the lecture. So let's say I want to create a pair of keys. The pair of keys will be what we want to do is do something like SSH key. For example, this is specified on RSA keys. You can also have like, uh, like mm, the core keys and the second values kind of the size of the key. So I can do that. It's gonna generate the, the, the pair, it's gonna ask me like, where to save it, default value, then it's gonna be asking me for a password. And this is important because it's really easy to just like go through and like not specify a password, but that means that like right now, that file, if anyone gets a hold of it, it's just that person has the password for any server where you copy your keys over, right? So. The and that, that can that depending on where to remove that will be fine or that will be not fine because it's like someone that has the value that has the, the key we have access to like any server if you want to SSH it. You can specify a passphrase for your key that means that like every time you want to use your key, the key needs to be decrypted. So it can be used. So that will effectively be asking to you to use your password. But if we're back to the original problem again, like now I have this like really good keys, which are convenient for some other reasons. And I get to, but like you still have to do the, the passwords. The proper solution that I'm not gonna configure now right here because I'm gonna be really hairy because I already had some previous setup is using SSH agent. SSH agent will ask you for your password once, and it will remember within a session. And to kind of get give a very kind of example so you can relate to it, think about sudo. When a lot of the times you want to use sudo and like it asks you for the password one and then remembers for, for some time, you know, it depends how. This will, this will do the, the same. But for now I have not a specified passphrase, which means that if I copy my file over the server, I will be able to SSH without entering my password because I will copy my public key and I will keep my private key. And that way I will be able to authenticate the machine that I'm the person that copied that key and, and, and go over the machine. So to do that, you can do something really rudimentary. You can do like something like cutting the other file and say I want to assist like copy the public file, not copy the private file. You always use the public file, the public key, and then we SSH into this machine as some user, because depending on which like which user you choose you will be copying the, the key for that user. And then here we can do something like, uh, no. Ah. So you can do something like that. Authorized keys is what the server is going to be looking when you give your key and you encrypt. That one is going to be looking. The thing is, this, this can get some theory. So there's already a really neat tool called SSH copy V that will kind of do the thing so you don't mess up, you don't overwrite. Instead of appending, you might overwrite and then the server just lost all the history of previous. Uh, non service SSH copy V will do that for you. You can even specify different keys to be copied. 
So if we do that as as a for password, now has added the keys, and now I can try to SSH again, and hopefully things are done correctly. I go to reveal um, without having to put my password. And since I didn't specify a password for the key, you can add it for it. The probably the next any any questions so far? Uh, another thing that you will find yourself like doing all over all over again, like if, if you have your remote server, you're probably editing the files, maybe that you are editing the files there, but maybe you have to transfer your, your like data or your code that you already have. So you need to know how, how to copy files over SSH. You can do this like really rudimentary, like you can remember like we have a three, let's say for example, let's go to three. Like one thing we could do is just like, oh, we can cut this file SSH there. We can SSH there. And then there we can just P into some like same file or something. So this, what this is doing is cutting the file, then open an SSH connection, and then P, if you remember from the data running lecture, is both output into the STD out and also to the file. So this is effectively save it to the file. So you can do something like this, and, and it, will, it will work. Uh, but probably if you have, if you are copying a large amount of files, it gets really bad because then suddenly you have to find all those files and copy all of them. And there are better tools for that. So in the same way, in your computer, you will do CP from folder one to folder two. Uh, in when you have an SSH connection, you can do secure copy, which is just is SCP. That's what kind of that stands for, and you will do something like folder one to folder uh, one. And then to specify like the user, the server, and then what like where what the, where the path where you want to copy your files over at. And you will have to specify a similar plug, like if you want to copy like just a single file, you want to copy things recursively, etc. Et uh, one bad thing about the CP is that like doesn't the same way that CP doesn't know about like files that are already there. I think we already covered this in the common line environment. Uh, if you are copying a large amount of files and only a few of them have changed, SCP, we, we won't care. Like it will just start from the beginning, start copying all, all, all over the wire, and just overwrite all the files that it finds. And that's maybe what you want to do, but a lot of the time, if you are a kind of transmitting a lot of files over the network, you want to probably use rsync that knows, like A has a very understanding of you want to like copy siblings, if you will know about like the files that are already there, not copy them. Uh, you will also be able to resume, you have like, have to transfer say 100 gigabytes and like a really large file and it's interrupted halfway, Arsene will be able to like figure out what are the chunks that have already been transferred and resume from them. So it's a pretty handy tool. Um, next. Oh, another really common scenario when you are, for example, like an SSH into the VM, and maybe, for example, I want to leave some really long process run. And I could, like, leave it running, but as soon as I close the, as soon as I execute this, and as soon as I close the, the connection, it's gonna die. And depending on how the server is set up, this depending, depending on how the server is specified, even if you kind of background it, uh, when the parent process, which is the cell die, it can take away like, uh, it, sometimes it's the process itself or sometimes the permission to access file that the parent process have permissions to. So you can do things like background it and then like disown it uh, and things like that. There's like a really simple solution, which is doing just like know-how, which kind of takes care of doing all this for you will kind of remove the dependency from parent process to child process and it will background it perfectly. And the way we can just, I'm going to specify number, so 
Click 400, we can close the connection, we can do whatever we want, we can get back in again, and when, if we search for that process, it's still running. Uh, and then though you are using some interactive tool, say, like top, for example, that is displaying you all the values. And if you close your connection and then resume, yeah, maybe you can, figure, you can figure a way of having top like executing in the background, or like a single like a program that like has like a behavior like top, but like it's gonna be tricky to kind of reattach the output of that program. You can play your profile, but again, if you have something like an anchor space that is redrawing the entire the entire command line every second or so, it's gonna be really for the thing where you can use are called terminal multiplexers. Terminal multiplexer kind of creates a window within a window, and then you have, like for example, screen. It looks like nothing has changed, but like right now we're in the inner cell. I can execute top here, for example, and I can detach here, have like detach. Now we're back to the previous cell. We can close the connection. SSH again and say a screen minus R, R stands for like resume the connection, and top is speed running. So if you have like some long running job and something that is very interactive, it can be fairly convenient. And also, you have probably seen all of us at some point like using something slightly more advanced, which is Tmux, which screen has really basic kind of splitting capabilities. Tmux, fairly more powerful, allows you to kind of split them like side by side, you can create um, new tabs, and like for example I can leave like top running here too, and then you can detach, completely get out, and again I can just do like Tmax A for attach, and I get like the same layout that I have before, and I can easily navigate. And if you are like, like uh, for example, for my research I ended up having like Tmux session in remote servers that have like the GPUs that you would use for, for training models and it just it becomes mad because otherwise you just go and say that like they're opening a lot of connections or like uh, just trying to have a way where even if you lose connection everything kind of keeps working. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Next thing, the next thing is uh, sometimes you might have a program, this is Fairly common definition in software you, you can have, but like some programs will attach themselves to a port. So, for example, uh, if you have like a web server, you probably attach to the port 80, which is the default for like uh, HTTP, or you have like an SSH server, you will like attach to port 22. Sometimes, if the thing you're running is even going to attach in the remote web server, you're not going to be able to navigate. Like, if I have like a remote server, like a um, web server in my machine, I can just go to, like, you can just go to like localhost 80, and like that will work. But if you are doing that in a remote machine, and that remote machine is not publicly available through the internet, which is the case for most machines, because like, like network engineers don't like the machines being just like out there in the wild. There's like a lot of security you have to kind of figure out to properly do that. We'll probably have blocked a lot of the ports to go through, like openly through the internet. The thing you want to do in that case is to do port forward. And I have, I think, listed in the in the course website a really good graphic that like kind of explains the things that you can do with that. Because can can get like this slightly hairy zigzag thing. So they're like both a uh, local port forwarding. What you're saying is, when I try to go to a local port in my machine, like in my laptop, forward that traffic to the remote machine. And you have the inverse, which is remote port forwarding, which says when that when the remote machine tries to go to some local port, like some like, it just forward that to my machine. So and now I'm gonna give like a sort of example of, for example, really common thing in kind of scientific computing is you maybe want to do like Jupyter Notebook 
and you build the notebook will by default attach to port 8.8.8.8 but we cannot access easily this machine so what we need to do is we're going to stop this and what we need to do is when we are SSHing we are going to specify that we want to forward the 9999 port of my machine to the 8.8.8 port in the Linux remote machine And now, if we do that, and we run now with the notebook, we, we still get this, this value. And if we navigate to a web browser, if I try to type this here, it doesn't, doesn't really work, right? Because this is the 888, and I'm forwarding to the 999. And if I do that, I'm right now getting in this browser, this is going through SSH and accessing the 888 port of the remote machine. You can do even more powerful stuff that I'm not gonna get into because you have to edit some web more files, but for example, say your like your work is blocking Reddit, like for example. You can specify, you can create like an SSH tunnel and specify in your like um, host configuration files that every time you try to go to reddit.com, that traffic, instead of going directly from your computer, gets forwarded to through that SSH tunnel and goes from like the server. And the inverse which I didn't cover an example was for example you have like something like Sublime and you want to for Sublime, which is more of a graphical tool to edit remote files, you can do remote uh, port forwarding, which will mean that the remote server will try to access a port a local port and that will get forwarded to your computer where you will say which changes are being made to the file. So you, you cannot have like uh, both local and remote are useful in different scenarios. Any questions? Is there any permanent way of forwarding the port? Or is it, is that the Zarya notebook? Define permanent. Define permanent. Okay. Okay. Um, is that of SSHing through Like that connection is gonna interrupt, like no matter no matter, no matter what. So like you can have like something. I'm not throwing that. I think like something like auto SSH that we keep like reconnecting every time that do like disconnect and you can have like some background process that like keeps leaking it back through. But I haven't run into that scenario. Yeah, I mean it really depends on what you mean by always because uh, the, the port forwarding happens over your SSH connection. It's basically multiplexing stuff onto a single connection, right? So if your connection goes away, all the forwarded connections are also going to go away. Um, there are ways you can say that whenever I SSH to this machine, I want to also forward a port. Um, and so if you look at your SSH config, I, from memory, I think you can configure it there to say that always forward the following port. Um, and so that might be what you want. I don't think there's anything that will like ensure that you reestablish those connections. Uh, the sort of this permanent portfolio. Yeah. I don't think that's the case. So. And the next thing is sometimes you run into like some software that is not written to be kind of easy interacted to like the common line or that like relies for some reason in some uh, graphical user interface. One thing that you can always do is do this uh, just you probably have seen these tools where you're doing like some remote desktop like you are like what is happening is the remote server is kind of capturing the entire uh, desktop environment and sending it back to you or like the delta uh, more or less and you are if the local software is capturing all your actions and sending all that back but maybe you don't even want your like remote server to run like an entire desktop environment so one really neat thing that you can do is that like you can tell the SSH to do what is called graphics for work. And more, more in Linux, the kind of the default uh, graphics environment, which is like X11, which can also be installed in Mac, uh, allow you to kind of make the remote server kind of pipe all the graphics through the SSH connection, and for that to be rendered in your login machine. 
to example, if I specify here minus x squared and I SSH and I put the others properly. Uh, and we try to do now Firefox, for example. Uh, it's going to open here Firefox. And that Firefox is not in memory. Like that Firefox is entirely being forwarded through the SSH connection. And if I, like, I'm drawing it, I, like, I can move it around. I can like, ask like, to things in the software. And that like, can be convenient sometimes. Like if you have like, some software that doesn't really place nicely with the command line, you can just like forward the entire thing. Um, oh, and for that to work, the SSH server has to have that like enabled. Although I think by default, most distributions that like support like the SSH server will have that enabled by default. You have to kind of, like some like uh, sysadmins might disable it for some reason. Uh, Getting back to your point, you can, you know, a really, a really good mm, way to have like a roaming uh, for forwarding, but there is a really good way to having like a roaming SSH connect. So there is this improvement on top of the SSH, which is called MOS, or like mobile cell. And MOS is slightly more intelligent and will be able to figure out when you have this connect. So say you like close your laptop and go home and open your laptop again. Like, a, your connection to the server has interrupted, and B, you maybe have to change your network. But like most will be able to figure that out. So I have already installed it in the machine. And um, again, like do the here. It will also, one of the ni nice things about like SSH is now I'm using MOS, which is slightly different from SSH, but also knows about SSH keys, and I didn't have to type any password because it's using the same SSH key. So I can be running here, something again, like really simple, like for example, top. Now I can come here into my VM, and I will say, oh, maybe I'm gonna have like a network outage in my VM. And like the network just dropped in my VM. And most, in a couple of seconds, should tell me that like there was like some contact was lost. It tells me there, and kind of freezes what it's doing right now, and now, like SSH by now, we just like have closed the connection, but now, if the server comes back up or like the network out uh, disappears, most continues working. Like it just it refresh in a couple of seconds. And again, if, if you kind of move all your environment, like your your editor or your like file management, to the command line, it can be really easy because you just have kind of a permanent connection to your to your servers. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, unfortunately, MOS doesn't work with like port forwarding or graphics forwarding. Um, the last thing I want to cover is uh, the SSH. Uh, fine, but the SSH compare. Briefly touch upon it, but like as you have seen, you can end up having like a really crazy thing where you can say, oh, maybe I want to do a bunch of stuff through SSH, and you start getting a really great comment. Like maybe you even want to specify which SSH key you want to be using. Um, and then what user you're having in the remote machine, and maybe what the address of the machine it is. And you, get like, and you don't want to be typing this thing over and over again. One idea is maybe I can just alias this entire thing. So just like instead of having to type the entire command, I can just type the end. There's a better alternative. The better alternative is using the SSH uh, config. So there's like this file here, which is the config file, which I have just uh, added the a default thing for the excellent forwarding. But we can just refactor the entire thing in uh, host specifications. For example, we can say, oh, the user I want to SSH to is, is full bar. And the host name is that address. And the port I want to SSH to is 22. This is like a different one. On the identity file I want to use is the the uh, default state. 
page, and even you can specify the remote forward that we were specifying, where you say, oh, port 999 is forwarded to port 888. You can also, as you're seeing, have like an asterisk you know, on top, but like you can even pattern match to like domains. So you can say, oh, I want a uh, save, like every time I'm SSH into any MIT uh, host, I want to be using a different user because I want to use my Kerberos, which is CUDA for some reason. Or like, is it like the SSH config will figure all that out for you. And now instead of typing a lot of things, I just type SSH VM, and again the VM and the remote forwarding is done and everything is working. Another great feature of having like a proper configured like SSH config is not only SSH is using, like all, all the other programs like rsync and SCP and MOS, we know about the this this thing. So you can easily like say, oh I want to MOS into VM. And it knows, like you just figure out to go to the file, read it out, and use it. And then you want to be careful, like eh, the SSH config in a way is a dot file, and depending on how paranoid you are, you may be fine including that if there's like not anything to split it. But maybe you don't want really people to know the service you're accessing. So bear that in mind when you're like including it or not including it into your uh, like uh, dot files. Last thing I want to cover is there's like an extra corner case is that sometimes you have like some software that you want to be running locally, but doesn't really play nicely with SSH and wants you have like some plain hierarchy. Like wants the things to be as files in your or like folders in your local file system. What you can do for that is using something like SSHFS, where you can say, oh, let's, uh, let me go to a temp file, and I can make a folder for dolls, and I can do something like, oh, I want to mount, uh, what this is saying is I want to mount the remote folder of downloads that is placing the VM host to the local downloads uh, folder. And I do that, and right now I can just go into there, and it's empty, and I can just create like a simple file. And now if I go into the VM, and I do like a file explorer, and I go into downloads, there's a file I just created. And like if some software like doesn't really play this nicely with like all the SSH, a lot of software will do, but if not, you can still mount the entire hierarchy. And like even here, we can see like the like the file as a local file. Uh, and lastly you have kind of have like uh, you just unmount it as like any uh, you will unmount any mount drive in the I think that covers pretty much all that I want to cover. Uh, th there's one more thing that's uh, handy to know about, and that is something called proxy jumping. Um, so very often, if you're SSHing to a machine, it's like behind a firewall, so you need to, this happens a lot in MIT, for example, where you can only access this machine if you're on the internal network. You could set up a VPN, of course, but setting up a VPN can be its own kind of painful. Um, and so often, there will be a, what's known as a bastion host. This is basically an SSH host that you are allowed to SSH into from any external service. For MIT, this is uh, like login.ccell.mit.edu or dialup.mit.edu. These are externally visible SSH machines. Um, and once you have SSH to those, you can then SSH from those to whatever machine you want to go to. So of course, for these cases, you can SSH to that machine and then type SSH again. But now it becomes really awkward to do, like, to either type in your password on this remote machine, or you have to do um, agent forwarding, which basically gives the other machine access to your private key. Uh, neither of which you might be okay with. Um, so the more recent versions of SSH have support for something called proxy jump, where you can say, "I want to SSH to this remote machine through this machine," uh, and it will never show your key material to the machine in between. And in fact, it means that, uh, let's say that I have hosts A and B and I have to SSH through A to get to B. I can set up a proxy jump and then on my machine, I will just type SSH B and it will do the right thing. Uh, you do this by, in your SSH config file, 
Uh, you declare a host called A, you declare a host called B, uh, whatever settings you want for usernames and identity files and ports and that kind of stuff. And then on B, you would add the, the line proxy jump A. And now all you have to do is type SSHB and it will do the right thing. It's handy to know about. Any more questions? 